Well, welcome FBC Salinas. Wherever you are, whenever you're watching this, we are glad that you are joining us today, and we are glad that we get to worship together. And I have a few announcements for you. And, and the first one is this. This Thursday, we have no Thursday night ministries. Uh, it's Thanksgiving. It's already here. Enjoy the time with your family. And uh, my second announcement is prayer concerns. Prayer is incredibly important here. And if you are in need of prayer, please email prayer at fbcsalinas.com. A whole team of people will be praying for you. And at this time, I would like to invite up Kylie Sloan. Kylie is once again part of the leadership team of Streets of Bethlehem. And she's going to talk to us for a moment about Streets of Bethlehem. Thank you, Adam. Guess what? What? We are one week closer to Streets. So that means that Streets is only a week and a half away. So time is flying. There has been a lot getting done behind the scenes. The back lot is being transformed with the sets. We have a recording of the script in English and in Spanish, which is something new that we're trying this year. Very excited about that. And we have a good amount of volunteers. So thank you all who have volunteered to help. We really appreciate it. There are still some ways to help for those of you who would like. We are looking for people for our prayer team. So you can do this from your house during the hours of the actual event. You sign on to a website and you will be able to respond to people who send in prayer requests. So that's a really big opportunity. And one of the reasons why we do this event is to be able to reach out to people. So please, if that's on your heart, contact us and we will get you plugged into that. We are still if you accepting volunteers for the actual event. So if you would like to do that, contact Mark or myself right away and we will find a spot for you. And lastly, you could all be praying for the event. So we're praying for good weather, praying for the work still to be done, for safety for the workers and everyone involved, and praying for all the people who will be coming through. God knows exactly who's going to show up and just praying for their hearts that God will be preparing them to hear his message and to respond to it. So thank you for that. Thank you, Kylie. And uh, I encourage us to find opportunities to serve. Servanthood is another core value that we have here at FBC. And Streets of Bethlehem is a great opportunity to serve. It's a great outreach. And uh, I encourage us to always be praying for it. And uh, speaking of prayer, let's open up in some prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the ability to worship you and proclaim that you are Lord. And Lord, I pray today as, as we worship you, I pray that you are glorified. Lord, I pray that we just stay focused on you and your goodness. And Lord, I thank you for all that you do. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, let's come together and lift our voices and worship the Lord. And uh, we do this because he is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. And this first song that we'll be singing is a new song that we are introducing. Feel free to sing along, even if you don't know it, or just really focus on the lyrics. This song talks about hailing the King, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So let's sing together. Oh, hey. 
guided prayer. And prayer is is so critical and essential to a Christ follower. Prayer time should be all the time. I mean, we should pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, uh, to quote Paul. And uh, here is another time that we get to come together and we get to pray. And uh, what is going to happen is we're going to go through some topics and we're going to pray about them and we're going to pray together. And I encourage you to take this time and pray as you feel led. Father, we thank you for this day once again, Lord. We thank you for every day that we just get to wake up and proclaim that you are Lord. And Lord, I thank you for the ability to do that. And Lord, today I wanna, I wanna pray for all of those who are, are hurting. Lord, I pray for healing uh, in our world, in our, in our country, in our state, in our city, in the city of Salinas, and even in our church. As uh, you know, issues can tend to come up and Lord, all this stuff with COVID, Lord, I pray for, for healing in, in all of these areas, Lord, and I pray that we listen to your guidance. Lord, I wanna lift up our missionaries. Today, I want to lift up our missionaries who are in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, those are the Chapmans. Lord, I pray that you guide them. You keep your arms wrapped around them. I pray you give them creative ways to get your word to the people of the DRC. 
Lord, and I, I, I thank you for their heart. Um, not many people are willing to, to go and do that. Uh, Lord, and I thank you for their sacrifice, and I pray you continue to look after them and continue to guide them. Lord, I want to lift up all of the churches who are meeting across Salinas, whether that be online or in person. Uh, Lord, and I want, today I want to lift up Salinas Valley Community Church, pastored by Mark Simmons. Lord, I pray that you guide them as they come together and they worship you. Lord, I pray that they worship you in spirit and in truth and uh, that your name is the name above every name and that gets proclaimed. And uh, as they come together and worship you, uh, I pray that you are glorified every step of the way. And Lord, I want to lift up FBC Salinas, uh, our community of Christ followers. Lord, uh, I pray you guide the leadership here um, as, you know, there are decisions that, that have to be made. Lord, I pray that we listen to your wisdom and your guidance. And Lord, let us not take a step that is uh, in a direction that you don't want us to go. Lord, let us, let us just be so in tune with that. And uh, Lord, I pray you give us guidance on uh, the decisions and the steps that we must make. Lord, I thank you for all that you do for us, just each and every day. Lord, we are so blessed. We thank you for your goodness and your provision. And Lord, we just thank you for everything that you give us. Lord, I pray that we glorify you in everything that we do. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And uh, there are many ways to support the ministry here at FBC and the ministries and the missionaries that we support all around the world. Uh, one of them is by uh, giving tithes and offerings. And that is, uh, you can go to fbcsalinas.com and click that yellow donate button. You can give that way. Uh, you can come by the church. We'd love to see you. Um, but however you do support the ministry of FBC, we want to thank you for your continued generosity. Before we get to the message this morning, I want to piggyback off what Adam said uh, as we were praying for our city. Uh, the other night, uh, there was an accident that happened involving Gino's, uh, one of our favorite restaurants uh, in Salinas, and, and many of us love Gino's an awful lot, and there was a car chase going on, and the car decided to go into the outdoor dining area of Geno's, and so some people were injured there. We're going to be praying for them as they recover from this, and uh, and just know that, um, and one of the, the interesting thing that I did not know was uh, one of the people that was injured in that accident uh, is having surgery today, and he is on the worship team at Salinas Valley Community Church. And so we're going to be praying for them uh, here in a few moments. And so I wanted to remind you of that. So let's keep those people in prayer as well. And the other thing is this, on a much, much more celebratory thing, it's this. I get to share some good news with you this morning, and it's good news we're celebrating. This past week, <coughs> I had the opportunity to meet with Bill and Betty Turner, and they are a phenomenal couple. And this weekend, they are celebrating their 64th wedding anniversary. Let that sink in. 64 years that they've been married, and we're so we're grateful for that. I encourage you to reach out to the Turners with a phone call or a text or whatever and let them know that, that that's quite an accomplishment. And so we're very, it was, it was neat to talk with them this last week and hear how they're doing and, and how God has walked them through. 64 years of marriage is, is phenomenal. And now we move into the message. Our definition of hero has changed over the course of this past year. 
teachers are now considered heroes for all that they have done to help teach through these very difficult times. In Salinas here, especially in the Salinas Valley, ag workers are now considered heroes for their tireless work in difficult situations to continue doing all they can to provide food, not only for this region, but for this country and this world. First responders entering into harm's way as they go to rescue people, as they go to deal with domestic violence issues or whatever the case may be, or fires, considered heroes. Nurses and doctors on the front lines this past year doing all they can to, to restore people's health to, as, they, as they battle through covid and this past week, our church has been, you know, we've been reminded of that as, as uh, friends of some people in the church are, are struggling through this. And even, even children in and, and, and other parts of the country are, are struggling through this from uh, as far as them being children of, of people in our church. Parents having to reshuffle their, their lives as they care for their children and teach and, and lead them through this difficult time. And then other people who are working tirelessly all the time to take care of, of providing all the needs that, that are out there, whether they be working in a grocery store, providing utilities, whatever the case may be, heroes, our understanding of heroes has taken on a whole different, whole different tack this year, a whole different grasp of what's going on. And as we wrap up this series, you'll notice that it's called Everyday Heroic Faith. And it's my belief and my contention that heroes are needed. Heroes are needed all the time. And especially in the world in which we live today, we need that. But so often we think of, of heroes as somebody that's not us. Yet according to Scripture, according to Scripture, it includes people just like us. And so I invite you now to come into the Bible and, and come into this place of Hebrews chapter 11 as we wrap up this marvelous chapter of Scripture. And we pick it up in verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They were killed. <clears throat> they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Father, we pray now as we come to this time of looking at your word and as we wrap up this series on everyday heroic faith. Lord, it's my prayer that your Holy Spirit would move in such a way that our minds would be open to the reality that you've called us all to be heroes. That our hearts would be transformed in such a way that we would remove excuses and replace it with faith that our eyes would be open to the opportunities that you're providing for us each and every day to be those very people who walk by faith, and that our ears would be attuned to your voice in the midst of the cacophony that's out there, that's distracting us. We would ask for ears that hear your still small voice leading us and guiding us. And Lord, may no one hear anything I say, but may they hear only what it is that you want them to hear and need them to hear. And Lord Jesus Christ, may you receive all glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 
Hebrews 11.32, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. Boy, that's a great list. And as we come to this end of, of Hebrews 11, you can almost see the writer of Hebrews saying, boy, I could keep writing about all these different people. But he comes to this place and just says, what more shall I say? And he gives us this list, and this list is filled with names, but there are more than names. Because each one of these names that he lists tells a great story. He starts with Gideon. Oh, that story of Gideon, isn't that magnificent? 300 soldiers defeating the biggest, baddest army of the day, the Midianites. He starts with that one. Then he moves to Barak, who, who alongside the prophetess Deborah, they defeat a massive army as well all because of faith. And then he moves into, he, he, he talks about Samson. Boy, you talk about a guy who had issues. He had a laundry list of issues, yet by faith, God worked through Samson. Then he moves into Jephthah, and that story found him in Judges chapter, it's, it's like Judges 7 in that area, I believe. But, but he talks about Jephthah, and what, a, what an amazing individual this guy was, and he makes this foolish, horrific vow, yet God uses him to free God's people. And then we come to David, and everybody says, well, yeah, David's got to be on the list. David's the greatest king that Israel had ever seen, and, and David is known as a man after God's own heart. And then he moves to Samuel, and Samuel provides somewhat of a bridge into bringing about a united monarchy, a united kingdom. And so, but Samuel, as you read this story, he had some problems too, yet he stayed the course for God's people in the midst of some very difficult times. And then instead of listing all the prophets, the writer simply says the prophets. And as you read through all the prophets, you'll come to understand this, that they're proclaiming God's truth no matter what. The situation was not easy. The situation was very cloudy. The situation at, at many times was difficult. And there were people saying, we're not going to listen to you. Yet the prophets walked by faith. See, these names here are more than names. These names tell a story. Just as your name is more than simply a name, it tells a story. The question is, what is that story that your name is telling? What is that story that your name shares? Is it a story of, of, of how God has worked in your life and how God is moving your life? Or is it a story of, of woe and, and, and a story of all about you? What is the story of your name? What is the story that people read when they hear your name? Better said, what is the story people hear when they hear your name? So he starts off in such a beautiful way, and you get all excited about this, and, and he continues on, and then he explains all these things, and he goes through all these different moments, but yet because of God, they're more than moments. Listen to what he says here in verse 33. He says, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. I want to stop there. We continue on in this, in this passage, and, and we read through verses 33 to the middle part of verse 35, and it's all this wonderful stuff. And these are wonderful moments that grab our attention. People who shut the mouths of lions, that refers back to the moment when Daniel's in that lion's den. Now, who shut the mouths of the lions? Not Daniel. But God, Daniel was walking by faith, and God closed the mouths of those lions. Then goes into quenching the fury of the flames. Who quenched the fury of the flames of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Not those three guys, but God. They were walking by faith. 
They said to Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to do what you're telling us to do. We're not going to bow down to you. And if that means that we will die, so be it. But we know that we are going to follow our God. God quenches the fury of the flames. Each one of these situations addresses a moment in, in Israel's history. And it also includes, and this is one that we don't quite, quite see that clearly. Well, and frankly, we can't see it very clearly at all. But when he talks about escape the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to battle, talking about these different things, and we'll continue on in the list here in just a little while, we forget that there's this period between the end of Malachi and Matthew where people continued struggling and continued suffering for their faith and some of the some of what some of what happened to them was horrific yet they continued on in faith see that's the way god operates and it's amazing it's an amazing list and especially as we get to verse 35 where we receive where we see this women receive back their dead raised to life again and it's like oh my gosh this is this is a phenomenal experience and and it's all such good news quenching the fury of the flames t- shutting the mouths of lions routing foreign armies weakness becoming strength It's all good. It's all good. Conquering kingdoms, administering justice. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. And there's a temptation to think that everything always works out perfectly. Works out without a hitch. Yet the writer of Hebrews knows that life is real. And one of the things that I've said over and over again is this, the Bible is unafraid to talk about the realness of life. The Bible is unafraid to do this. And we see that very true, to see that very, very, very truthfully here in verse 35. We read, women receive back their dead, raised to life again. We get excited about that. And then we read these words. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. The writer of Hebrews does not back away from saying things don't always go perfectly, at least from an earthly perspective. And in all my years, when people have come to place their trust in Jesus Christ, I've never once heard a person say, you know what, I'm looking forward to the suffering. Never heard that comment before. The comment is, I'm grateful that my sins are forgiven. I'm grateful that I, that I get to go to heaven later on in life. I'm grateful that I get to experience eternal life today. It's all about this good and this good and this good. And all those things, hear me, I'm not discounting them. I'm not saying that's not important. But I've never once heard anyone say, I look forward to being jeered. I look forward to being persecuted. I look forward to being mistreated. No one signs up for that, yet it happens. It happens. The writer of Hebrews is unafraid to give us the full picture. He's unafraid to let us know difficult times happen. We need to consider the following. Out of the 12 apostles, 11 of them were martyred. One of the bright lights in the early church was a guy by the name of Stephen. We read of him being stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. The apostle Paul, who who wrote most of the New Testament, shares with us a list of, of, of things that happened to him. And I invite you to flip a few pages back. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and listen to what he says as far as his experience of walking by faith. We pick it up 
in verse 23, says, are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. Like this. I am more, and here we go. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was bitten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul walked by faith and experienced all of that. The writer of Hebrews is not afraid to talk about the realness of life. According to Open Doors USA, which is an organization that that does all they can to provide help to those being persecuted in the world today, they released some eye-opening numbers about the amount of persecution happening today. Over 260 million Christ followers live in places where they experience high levels of persecution. 260 million. Almost 3,000 Christ followers were killed for their faith in the past year, which averages out to eight a day. Close to 9,500 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked this past year. A little over 3,700 Christ followers have been detained without trial. They've been arrested. They've been sentenced or imprisoned. And there are currently 24 countries in the world who criminalize any person converting to Christianity. In the midst of these difficult situations, it's easy to ask, where is the Lord in the midst of this mess? Where is the Lord in the midst of the pain? Where is the Lord in the midst of these difficult times? A day does not go by where I don't pray for my family. And trust me, there have been more than a few sleepless nights when I ached for Dawn and for our daughters, Stephanie and Heidi, as one of them may very well have been experiencing something that was not enjoyable in their lives. I cried out to God to remedy the situation. I cried out to God to heal them. I cried out to God to take away the pain that they were experiencing. And the response that I received was silence. So I would cry out all the more because of the injustice they were experiencing or the pain they were suffering. And I received the same response of silence. And in the midst of these, there's this temptation to believe that the Lord does not care. And there's a part of me as I read the story of of what happened to Stephen and as I read through the list that Paul lists in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, as I consider the fact that there are people being persecuted right now all throughout the world, and then I I think of, of, of what happened to 11 of the 12 apostles. And I can't help but think that they cried out for help in the midst of what they were experiencing, and there was silence. And in the midst of that silence, there's a temptation to forget that God is there. There's a temptation to forget that that he is in the midst of that silence with us. I know this for a fact that many people in this church have been crying out to God for a number of things. And they've been met with what looks to be silence. And there's a temptation to think that God is not there. 
Hebrews chapter 11, as we were reading through that, through that list of, be, of people being tortured, of people being sawed in two, of people being stoned to death, of people experiencing jeers and flogging, there are those times in the midst of the crisis where we can cry out and say, where are you, God? How are you going to keep walking me through this? And yet they continued on with by faith, by faith, by faith. And in the midst of those times when we find silence, we need to remember that God is there. I invite you to turn your Bibles back to Psalm 77 and listen to what the psalmist says here. Because I think what the psalmist says here is a great way for us to remember that the Lord is with us. Listen to these words. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out my, my, my untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. You been there? You've been there when you're crying out to God. You're asking for help. You're asking for help. You're asking for him to do this, and you're asking for him to come into this situation with COVID, and you're crying out, and you're crying out, and you're crying out, and it seems as if he's not there. You're stretching out untiring hands, and you want to be comforted, yet that comfort doesn't seem to come. And then verse 5, I thought about the former days. The days of long ago, I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? We've been there. The people in Hebrews 11 had been there. Wondering, where are you? What's going on? What's going on? Verse 10. Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand, I will remember the deeds of Yahweh. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the world when your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Did you see what that just said? Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters though your footprints were not seen. In the midst of the silence, God is there. In the midst of the difficulty, God is there. He does not fail. So whatever you're experiencing in life right now, may you know this, the world will offer you a variety of opportunities. The world will say, well, you need to buy more stuff. Or the world will say, oh, just get bitter and get angry and go get even. The world will offer you all these types of things. But notice back in Hebrews chapter 11, when the people were experiencing all these difficult times. Part of the reason why they continued on was, yes, because God was with them and because, yes, their faith was, was in him and this God who was faithful all the time. But notice what it says in verse 38. The world was not worthy of them. The world's ways could not take care of them. And that holds true today. The world's ways are tempting. The world's ways are there. And in the midst of it, God says, I'm still here. I'm walking you through this. I will not let you down. 
So in the temptation of forgetting that he is, and believing that he has forgotten us, we need to remember that he never forgets. He can't forget. God never takes a day off. He never takes a moment off. He's there. God keeps moving in the midst of difficult times. The writer of Hebrews alludes to this, and writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 alludes to this. Not just alludes to it, he lays it all out there. These people refused to turn away. These people said, I'm trusting in God because God is walking with me. I might not know what's going on. I might not fully understand it, but I know that God's going to keep me going. Remember those stats I shared with you just a few moments ago about how many people are being persecuted in this this world? China is the number one country in government restrictions regarding Christianity. It's been that way for decades. Yet since 1949, get this, yet since 1949, the number of Christ followers has grown from 1.3 million to 81 million today. Striking, isn't it? All these restrictions, all these threats, all this persecution, yet in the midst of it, God's kingdom continues to rise. God doesn't take time off. He moves in the midst of difficulties. And as he moves in the midst of these difficulties, and as we continue on, we come to verse 38 where we read, the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. And we say, wow, that's a great place to finish. But no, the writer of Hebrews is not done. Because it's not simply more than names and more than moments, it's more than a list. So right at verse 38, we're thinking, okay, he's wrapped this up and he's moving on. But notice what he does in 39. He says, these were all commended for their faith. Where did we read that? Hebrews 11.1. 1. The ancients were commended for their, actually, Hebrews 11.2. The ancients were commended for their faith. What does commended for their faith mean? It says they were used as examples. All these people were used as examples. Whether it was really good news or it wasn't good news, he's using them as examples. And notice the next part. It says this, yet none of them received what had been promised. Not one of them. Not one. And then he says this in verse 40. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. What? What? Do you see this? Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us. I submit to you that we are now folded in to this list of heroes in Hebrews chapter 11. Let that sink in. God had planned something better for us so that only, only together with us, with us, us means us, Yes, it, 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 the writer of Hebrews is talking to people back, back in his day who were going through difficult times, and that's part of the list. But remember, God's word is timely, and God's word is timeless. What was said then is still true today. And so we read this, and, 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 and it's, it's phenomenal stuff. But yet, when we think about this list of people, The Abrahams, the Isaacs, the Jacobs, the Josephs, the Moseses, the the Enochs. When we think about all them, we say, wow, they're incredible people. The Gideons, the Baraks, the Samsons, the Jephthahs, the Davids, the Samuels, the prophets. We go, wow, they're phenomenal people. And yet now, what does he do? He throws us into this list. And the doubts all of a sudden arise when we realize the list 
includes us. Oh, Pastor John, that can't be true. That can't be true that we're part of this list. I'll read it again. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us so that together with us, they would be made perfect. Well, what? I, I didn't stutter there. I didn't stumble. We're in the list. We're in the list. And we want so much to just say, oh, no, I, I can't go into that list. Yet God says, I want you in that list. I've done everything to put you in that list. We need to understand the power of the two R's. We need to understand the power of the two R's when we come to these places where we doubt that we should be on this list. And those two R's are this, remove is the first R and replace is the second R. We need to remove the word but from our lives when it comes to living by faith. And let me give you a series of examples to drive home what I'm trying to say here. I believe the Lord wants to use me, but I get angry. Really? So did Moses. And look what the Lord did in his life through Moses walking by faith. Well, I believe the Lord wants to use me, but, but I don't believe I have a lot of worth. Really? So did a person by the name of Gideon, who was scared half to death in the threshing floor. And God said, hello, mighty warrior. And Gideon's response is, you must be talking about somebody else. And God used him. Well, I believe that the Lord really wants to use me, but, but I don't have a reputation. I have a reputation that's not exactly stellar. Really? Why don't you get talk to Rahab, talking about a bad reputation? She was a prostitute, and God used her. I believe the Lord wants to use me, but, but I can be pretty impulsive. Really? Jephthah was pretty impulsive, and God used him. I believe the Lord wants to use me, but, but at my age, I think there's not much the Lord can do in my life. Really? Enoch walked with God for 365 years. God used him. I believe the Lord wants to use me, but I have more issues than non-issues in my life. Really? Samson, oh my, what a list. That guy had more problems than anybody I've ever read about in the Bible almost. And yet God used him. Imagine what your life would look like. Imagine what my life would look like if we removed the little word but and replaced it with by faith in the Lord. By faith that the Lord will work for me. Let me go over a couple of these. I believe the Lord wants to use me and by faith the Lord will work to conquer my anger as I serve him. I believe the Lord wants to use me, and by faith, the Lord will work through my life no matter what I think of myself. I believe the Lord wants to use me, and by faith, he will, he will redeem my past reputation and restore me and continue working through my life. I believe the Lord wants to use me, and by faith, he will walk me through all these issues as I seek to serve him. It goes on and on again. Folks, folks, please remove the excuses and replace it with by faith. Remove the excuses and replace it by faith. Every person in Hebrews chapter 11 had a list of excuses. And every person said, by faith, Lord, use me. And how is it possible that he says, since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect? Great question. Go to Galatians chapter 2 as we begin to wrap this up and listen to what happens here. We get to be heroes not because of us, but because of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. 
and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The entire list of people in Hebrews chapter 11 is an awesome list of individuals. Yet we're told this, that only together with us can they be made perfect. That means we are included. And we're included because they were anticipating it and we now get to see it. But all of history hinges upon the one hero and it's Jesus Christ. He's the hero. He's the one who did it all. And he's the one who says, place your faith in me and watch what happens. The invitation to live by faith includes you. And it includes me. And that's made possible because of Jesus Christ. The one who all of history, both prior to his arrival and since his arrival, all of time hinges on him, the great hero of the faith, the one who lived out every day heroic faith, and the one who never failed. I want to ask Heidi and Kylie to come back up as we get ready to sing another song, and as they get ready, I want to encourage you to take a look at that list in Hebrews 11. Encourage you to take a look at all these different individuals who had issues, who had problems, who, who struggled with, with so many different things, and yet by faith, by faith, they lived their lives. By faith, they continued moving on, whether it was good or bad, whether they received what was promised or not, they kept moving forward. The invitation to all of us is to live by faith. Not faith in us, but faith in Jesus Christ. The one who understands everything that's gone on and will continue going on in our lives. Father, we pray as we consider these words, especially these last couple of verses of Hebrews 11. Lord, it's easy. I confess it's real easy to have a list of excuses that's a mile long. And yet you say, I want you to walk by faith. Lord, I know this to be true, that there are plenty of people who have allowed the excuses to rule their lives and they refuse to believe that they can walk by faith. And it's my prayer that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would move in their lives to remove the excuses and replace it with faith. Faith not in ourselves, but faith in you so that we can continue moving forward. Not for our glory, but for yours. Lord, you know us, and I pray that you would use us as we walk by faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God Our God And if our God for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. God is greater, our God is stronger, our God is healer, awesome in wonder. May that truth ring true in your lives in this upcoming week, and as you wrestle with these excuses that all of us have about being included in that by faith list in Hebrews chapter 11, as you wrestle with that, may you know this, that our God is greater than your excuses, and our God wants to walk in your lives, in your life and in my life, by faith. If you have questions about that, please reach out to us. Let us know how we can help you and know this, that he is with us, he loves us, he cares for us, and he invites us to walk by faith. God bless you. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.